Hi guys, I am taking a little detour from the lore videos to do a theory video slash history video uh, specifically regarding sorcery in the game because I started to look into this as a way to kind of find out the history of stars and whatnot and I found out that sorcery is such a it's such a huge topic in this game and there's a lot of history involved with it and I thought it might be helpful to maybe make a video that kind of broke it down or at least provided some timelines to see like when it was established and the importance of it and the origination of it because it's got a huge part in the game in terms of um, just its involvement with the story and whatnot. So there are a list of many different sorceries in the game. Um, but for this video, we're just going to focus on these first six, which I think are the most profound or they have the biggest impact on the story overall. So starting with the Carian Royal Family and Academy of Rhea Lucaria sorceries, um, I put together a timeline and if, if I wasn't sure about something or if I didn't find something to that like directly stated this inference, I've highlighted in yellow just to distinguish it from things that I'm pretty sure I, I'm they're fact it's just this these are all just taken and I have also cited everything down here so if there's anything here that you want to go look up yourself you have the item you can go read the description for it um so starting out it looks like the house of Caria was its own entity and I think that they probably very early on learned glintstone sorcery and they either learned it of their own accord or they picked it up from the Crystallians. We'll get into that more. But I think in the very beginning, the House of Caria very early on started to use glintstone magic and they named their fighters the glintstone knights. This one I had to highlight in yellow because I'm not, I could not find anything about the establishment of the Academy of Rhea Lucaria. And also, if you if you can fill in the blanks or if you've come across something that states specifically in text either of these or it clears something out, like please let me know. This is just a discussion video and a theory video. It is not meant to be fact. I know I'm presenting it like <laughs> I'm a teacher, but I just visually it, it I think it helps to put a timeline together. So the, the, re the reason I think the House of Caria found the Academy is because the naming convention right here, Raya Lucaria, Raya Lucaria, I mean, obviously has Caria in, in the name right there. So I, I would think that the House of Caria established Raya Lucaria and possibly to continue teaching their knights or it was just a endeavor for them to, I don't know, make their mark as um as a great household but i definitely think this can pretty much be inferred i don't i don't think it's the other way around that wouldn't make sense and uh, very early on at the academy you have master azure who founds the Corallos conspectus and conspectus just means like school of study so you see conspectus here it's just a school of study so azure who's going to be very important figure he founds the Corollas conspectus and that is the study of comets and he is one of the great teachers of the academy and then you have lucette who founds the alivinus conspectus alivinus conspectus and that is the study of meteors so you can see that these two masters right here were focused on the study of space objects and space beings and that is the oldest in terms of the conspectus at the academy these are the oldest um, schools of study and then you have other ones that are formed the hyma conspectus the twin stay twin sage the herodas and i don't know at what time but i'm assuming they they had to come after these because these are the two kind of foundational ones uh and then we see a reference to young renala who learns lunar magic and she impresses the academy with it. And sometime in her her timeline, she becomes the head of Rhea Lucaria. Is it Rhea Lucaria? I think it's Rhea Lucaria. So I think she becomes the head shortly after kind of entering the academy and really wowing them. 
And then she establishes the House of Caria as royalty. So up until this point, they weren't actually ordained royalty. She kind of does that herself. Moving on, so the Glintstone Knights from the original House of Caria lineage are anointed as royal knights. So now they are Carian royal knights serving her family, and they continue to develop sword sorcery for their knights to use. And so all of the Carian family sorceries are like the blade sorceries that you see. The Lazuli Conspectus is founded. So this one is really important because of its connotation with the so the, this um, school of study was founded to study Karian sorceries, but it becomes a heretical view that the moon is equal to stars because the moon is extremely important to the Karia family. Uh, Renala is queen of the moon, and you see that her lunar magic and Rani's dark moon magic is very important to their lineage. But it seems like the stars are above the moon, so in terms of ranking or importance you have the stars and, and and saying that the moon was equal to the stars or has as much influence over fate is a very unorthodox view that was held by by these um, sorcerers and then we have the second Luarnian war which is where Renala fights alongside her allies by oath troll knights of Caria and I, I was really interested in this allies by oath because I'm, I don't know what the oath was. I, I wasn't able to find anything in my item list about that. If anyone has any insight about what that oath was, that would be great because I'm really interested. And of course, you see the enchanted troll knights. You see them all over in the map, several areas. And um, I think you see them in the cutscene as well for one of the, the game trailers, but um, yeah, that's the Second Luarnian War, and that is the war in which Renala and Radigan fall in love, and so Radigan's sent over there to to quash the conflict because in the First Luarnian War, Radigan won, and in the second one, Renala wins his heart, which is kind of cute, although we know it's a sad ending, unfortunately. But Radigan moves in, and he studies sorcery at Rey Lucaria. And somewhere in the timeline, their children, Verdon, Rikard, and Rani are born. Um, and then Sorcerer, so Azur and Lusat, if you remember from the last slide, are banished from the Academy for trying to hone the primeval current. And we will get more into what the primeval current is later on. But they are pushed out of the Academy for practicing this. Now, the Academy at some point creates their own army. And they are called the Cuckoo Knights. And the Karian royal family starts to maybe suspect that there is going to be some sort of disloyalty. I'm thinking things between the two, the Karian royal family and academy, are not going well. Maybe it's it partly because of the banishment of Azur and Lasat. Maybe that had something to do with it. And so they, there's sort of some tension between them. And you could see the Karian royal family develop a special sorcery just anticipation of disloyalty with the academy. And that's Karian re retaliation right here. So this kind of shows me that things were kind of on rocky ground and not going so well. At some point, and I don't know at what point in this timeline this happens, the reason I put this, uh, so the Karian royals established the Karian study hall. The reason I put it here in the timeline because I thought, well, why would why would they need their own study hall if you know Raya Lucario was was founded by them? And I thought, well, maybe it has something to do with the growing dissension between the academy and the Karian family. Did they want their own? Does this have something to do with pride? They wanted to do it their way. Um, so I'm not sure exactly when this happened, but it kind of shows me that they things they they weren't really getting along that well for them to go and create their own study hall or this could have predated as well like i said it's in yellow so i'm really not sure um and then the inevitable the sad the sad part radigan leaves for nala and after that Renala is beside herself she's just heartbroken and the academy rebels against the Karian royal family i'm not sure if they saw this as 
the, the last straw or they were waiting for it to happen. But at this point, they see her as an incompetent leader and she is imprisoned in the library at Raya Lucaria. And then the manor falls under attack. There are the, the Cuckoo Knights, which are again led by the Academy, lead a siege against the Karia Manor. And after that point, the Karia Manor is heavily booby-trapped. If, if you remember in the game, when you go there, you're just attacked by, you know, you're attacked by all the Karian knights that are there, all of the projections of whatever spirits, traps, spirit booby traps they have. It's very, very um, heavily guarded. And then the Karian knights, the actual Karian knights, not the, um, not the projections, they fall into disarray and probably just... Um, at that point, disperse. And, okay, so going back, what is the primeval current? Now, this is very important because of its implications in what happens in the story. So, primeval means ancient. It's primal. So, you can probably assume this is some sort of ancient primal sorcery. Current means stream. So, in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, it's just like this, this stream of ancient power and it said that the eldest primeval sorcery was discovered by an astrologer, and astrologers could read the fate in stars. It's the foundation of glintstone sorcery, so it's like the foundation from whence all of the sorceries to come afterwards were founded upon. And we can assume that it's unstable or dangerous to study because it drove both Azure and Lusat to a catatonic state because they were big proponents of it. Actually, they were the ones who created founded the primeval sorceries that you use in game and when you find them later on their bodies are basically husks they are completely overgrown with glintstones and they are nearly inorganic they are no longer human they're no longer living beings so we can assume that the primeval current was something very dangerous when they saw into the abyss of the primeval current they kind of lost their minds and it was forbidden by the Academy. Now I put by Renala by question mark because if you talk to Selene, she will tell you, she will say she's a big proponent. She wants to hone the primeval current. And this is something that both Azir and Lusat were trying to do. So honing the primeval current, I don't know if that meant harnessing its power or whatnot, or trying to re return glintstone sorcery to a more powerful form. But for whatever reason, that that's why they were expelled. I thought I think Renala was behind that decision because Selene seems to still talk highly of the Academy when you meet her. But she says lines about wanting to see the Karian royal family fail and, and things like that. And then we see the Graven School mages who it's a, it's a practice of they collect sorcerers to fashion them as seeds of stars. And so... I sort of assume that honing that primeval current means returning to star form. And I think Selen has some dialogue that kind of implies that as well. It's like this wanting to go back to this original, very primal, basic form of sorcery. And these are just some items regarding that. So right here you can see the Graven School Talisman. And these are all sorcerers, it seems, that have been compiled in this really heretical manner because they want to try and make them into a star it just seems just seems like a really uh, bad idea you can understand why it was forbidden practice so moving on to the crystallians so the crystallians are the inorganic beings that you see and of course they have the, the crystal bodies now this line caused a little bit of confusion for me they cleave close to the ideals of the primeval current, and as such, they are revered guests of the sorcerers. And it seems to contradict when you go back to this, um, right here, the, the primeval current was forbidden by the academy, yet the Crystallians were revered guests because they cleave close to the ideals of it. So I don't really understand what that means. I am assuming that because they cleave close to it doesn't necessarily mean they're trying to hone it they they just they respect it and maybe that's what that means but what i was really interested here is the history between the crystallians and the karin royal family 
because there is a sorcery, it is um, magic downpour that states that the Karin royal family was taught this to mark the swearing of the old concord, which is an agreement, which means that makes me think that the Glenstone Knights once clashed with the Crystallians. So I don't know where that might have started. If there was some sort of conflict where was the House of Caria going out there and trying to mine Glintstone and did they clash with the Crystallians and did they reach some sort of agreement over like shared property or something? So there's definitely some history there between them, but I don't necessarily know what that is. And I was also curious too about the Crystallian Cario agreement include their fate being linked to the stars because Selen says the stars alter the fate of the Carian royal family. And I don't know if that's a exclusive statement. Does that mean the stars alter the fate of the Carian royal family alone or do the stars alter the fate of everybody? I'm not really sure. So kind of put a question mark there. Think about that one. But the Crystallian cognition which is the practice of acquiring knowledge, was called the Wisdom of Stone, and you had a subset group of sorcerers called the Crystal Cadre who wanted to pursue that Crystallian Wisdom of Stone. So the Crystallians are really interesting just because of, I don't really know what their history is exactly regarding, regarding sorcery, but it seems like they established their own sorcery before the Karian royal family, so I'm not sure if this makes them the first kind of sorcerers in the game, but they're definitely an interesting group to look at for sure, and I think there's a lot more to learn about them. So one thing that is really interesting is when you cast sorceries, they have a sort of insignia, they have a kind of like a trademark, and... They all have different ones, and, and they're all grouped. So the Karian royal family sorceries have an insignia, and Raya Lucaria has an insignia. But what I thought was really interesting was that the Karian royal family and the Crystallian sorcery spells, they both have the same logo. <laughs> Not logo, but they both have the same mark. So when you cast a spell, it looks like a staff and a sword. And I thought this was really interesting, and this probably means something for sure. What I'm thinking it means is you have the sword representing the Karian royal family, and you have the staff representing the Crystallians, and sort of like an alliance between the two. That's what I'm thinking this means, but I could be wrong about that. But it is definitely worth of note that they they have the same logo for both of the Crystallian or Crystallian sorcery and the Karian royal family sorcery. And the next thing to notice is that the primeval, the primeval spells don't have a calling card. So they don't have a symbol when you cast a spell. It is just kind of chaotic. In fact, when, it, when you cast a spell, it sort of looks like they are just ripping out of the space uh, space itself it looks like you're kind of art altering the power of the universe and I, th I think that's supposed to be representative of this is very unstable magic so unstable that even Lusat and Azur who created the two primeval sorceries or found them they weren't even able to really mark it it's just that crazy and untamable I think that's what that means so really interesting though about about the way that the different sorceries are sort of branded. Now moving on to the next big chunk of history, the next big, big parts of sorcery history. So we have Celia, the town of sorcery, and the Eternal City timeline. And starting at the very beginning, we see that the Nox are banished underground by the Greater Well. And the, the Nox are a race of cold-blooded beings who invoked the wrath of the Greater Well. They did something to tick off the Greater Well the greater royal sends them underground. And I'm assuming that at this point, Noxtella and Nokron are built and they are the cities of eternal night. You go underground and they never see the sun and they just live in darkness 24 seven. So then we have the sorcery of the eternal city and we can assume that the eternal city sorcery was quite vast and there was a lot to it. it they probably 
really wanted to perfect what they were working on. And for who knows what purpose, they did not like the greater will and the greater will did not like them. So I'm sure it was sorcery that was up to no good <laughs> in over in Nakron. So the Alabaster and Onyx Lords are referred to in the game as these ancient beings with skin of stone who came to life after a meteorite hits. And I'm not sure at what point in the timeline is this is this before? Do, they, do these like go all the way back? Um, before everything else? It says ancient beings. <laughs> so I don't know how ancient exactly. There's a lot of references to ancients, ancient dragons, ancient beings. And so I don't know how, what ancient means exactly or what, how, what, where it puts on the timeline. But I just put it here because we do know that at some point, Alabaster and Onyx Lords arrive they are brought to life after a meteorite hits somewhere. And you can actually see there's some, there is a site of grace called Beside the, uh, beside the Pockmarked Glade, I think, Crater Pocked Glade. And you can see uh, there's people there kind of scurrying around for meteor meteorite shards. So we do know that it, a meteorite definitely hit. We just don't know at what time. But the next, the big thing that happens, so Estelle of the natural born void, Estelle levels the eternal city with gravity, sorcery, and Nakron therefore becomes inaccessible. Poor Nakron, can't get a break. But yes, Nakron is now no more, and that is when Celia is formed. So Celia is formed right above Nakron, and it may have been composed of some of the survivors or some of the people who escaped or maybe um, some of the Nox who I, I'm not sure exactly how or maybe they were just sorcerers who revered the eternal city and wanted to try and make Nakron 2.0 or something but anyway Seli is formed right above the the site of Nakron. Celia then starts to pursue sorcery as well and they pursue night sorcery and they also pursue the lost eternal city sorcery and they are able to um, retain a couple of those lost eternal city sorcery spells and their night sorcery is very linked to um, devious acts so Celia produces assassin sorcerers who go after their own and kill each other I'm not sure where this started why did they start producing these assassin sorcerers I'm not sure but that is what Celia is known for. So the Alabaster and Onyx Lords develop gravitational sorcery. And you can see this in the game too. Even when you're fighting them, they use gravity-based spells. And this sorcery first originated from wanting to harness the power that Estelle leveled the Eternal City with. And then we have young Radon. Young Radon arrives to study gravitational sorcery because he wants to prevent his massive weight from crushing his horse, which is so sweet of him. <laughs> I know there's a lot of debate about whether Rodan is a good guy, but we won't get into it in this video. But young Rodan arrives at Celia because he wants to study specifically gravitational sorcery, and he becomes a pupil of an alabaster lord. And the next part um, is highlighted in yellow because I'm really not sure at all what happened something happened so i think that rudan learns of the threats in the void and the alabaster lord tells him you know there's something creepy out there i have seen stuff i've got that thousand yards there let me tell you what's in space and rudan is taught by his teacher how to combat the stars and so that is his new plan whatever his plan is Whatever his plans were, he leaves Celia thinking, I have to challenge the stars. He specifically says, I thank you for your tutelage, for now I can challenge the stars. And this line right here, I thank you for your tutelage, for now I can challenge the stars, it really seems like he was given the assignment, or he learned, he said, I don't want this kind of stuff coming down to where I live, what can I do to fight it? And he was taught it by his his teacher. So. Again, this is this is in yellow because it's just not sure, but I think it's heavily implied that he something happened at Sully. He learned something that made him want to go and challenge the stars. And he does, and he wins. 
And then, of course, we have the famous Battle of Aeonia in which he fights Melania and Scarlet Rot spreads all over Caelid. It spreads to Celia and Celia, by the time we see it present day, seems to be largely abandoned for the most part with a lot of these grotesque um, growths growing all over the city. Rodan is then killed in the Rodan Festival of which we are responsible for and in that cutscene, we see something coming down from space and crashing into the ground, and that is what opens the path to Nokron. So I'm assuming it's a meteor crashing. It could be a stell crashing. That's why I put this in yellow. Uh, and I don't know was a stell there before, or is a stell there specifically after the. Radon's death so it's in yellow because I'm not sure I'm assuming Estelle is the one who came down and the whole reason Radon wanted to learn how to challenge the stars was because his his alabaster lord teacher told him warned him even said look Estelle is the one who Estelle is the one who leveled the eternal city to begin with don't let Estelle do it again so that is that is my theory about all of this, but Celia and the Eternal City, they have a very important timeline just because of the events that happen afterward in the game. Now, talking a little bit about Glintstones, because Glintstone seems to be the it seems to be the way in which you practice sorcery. It's it's the medium in which you can harness sorcery. It's using the staffs. A lot of the staffs will say infused with the glintstone, and that is what allows the caster to kind of draw out the magic. Selene calls it the amber of the cosmos. Now, amber is like resin. It is it's what is left over. So, amber of the cosmos um, contains residual life. So, it's very important. It's very, very related to the greater, bigger picture. I don't know when the first discovery of it was. I don't know who first discovered it, but it seems like it was first mined underground in tunnels. You have a lot of the mines that are around the game. And when you go in there, you see you see these diggers that are mining, but they're not necessarily mining glintstone. So I don't know exactly in those in those crystal tunnels if maybe if the implication is they they've been picked dry of glenstone but anyways if if glenstone was mined in these tunnels this would make me think that it's always been a part of the land or maybe um it's kind of like oil you know it's it's like this fossil fuel equivalent of their land i don't know if the cracked crystal can be somehow refined into glenstone i don't really know exactly what the cracked crystal is but the text for a crystal knife says that it's used as a tool to extract glintstone from broken rock so i'm assuming that glintstone might be extracted from these broken crystals and that's why and that's why they're there it's kind of like oh we've we've depleted our glintstone now we are going to just try and extract it from the crystals we find I'm not really sure and i just thought it was interesting that these diggers are they seem to be made out of glenstone in fact when you kill them they drop glenstone that's how you get glenstone from them and you can kind of see them sitting around and playing with it I kind of feel bad killing them it just seems like they're so focused on the job but i think this is just from overexposure you they've probably fused with the glenstone we saw that with lusat and azure just it's you're not you're probably not supposed to have such prolonged contact with it. i think it's just meant to show like it's it can be um it can be detrimental kind of like cancerous if you spend so much time around it okay so that wraps up my presentation on sorcery i i hope this maybe helps explain some things for some people i know making a timeline really helped me understand a little bit better about it and then allowed me to see certain things and make certain connections that i didn't otherwise know about so this is just a theory i'm not really sure exactly if i have it right or anything so if if anyone wants to contribute i would greatly welcome it definitely update me or correct me if there's anything here that you think 
I got wrong or that I can put out of order. And also, if you if you like this video, if you want to see more, I'm definitely open to doing more sort of like discussion, background videos, history videos. I'd love to do one about the overall kind of timeline of big events in Elden Ring. That one would be a great one to do, but yeah, let me know. Or if you want me to continue the sorcery, I know there's a lot of different sorceries there I, I didn't touch on. I just kind of want to do the big ones at first. But yeah, anyways, thanks for watching, guys, and I will see you next time. Bye!